a family member in that program by the feel of it, by the feel of it. When staff come out and engage you, and they're friendly, open, you know, when you can't find anybody and, you know, uh, everybody's kind of overwhelmed. Uh, I, I do uh, certain trainings on compassion fatigue and see, I see compassion fatigue coming from those old unconscious programs. For example, power and control. Let's say that your boss is into power and control and so are you. I can tell you, you're going to have some tough times. You know, you're going to go toe to toe a few times. Uh, and uh, so when we start to look at these things, uh, uh, I think compassion fatigue is mostly caused by, uh, number one, a, a misfit between my pathology and, and where I'm working, uh, and the other piece is, uh, you know, obviously is uh, this is something that, uh, a job that I like to do, uh, dealing with patients that I want to be with, and, uh, you know, that certainly makes a positive difference. Now, I also want to talk about this model from another perspective, or at least spend a few minutes, but I think before we do that, might be a good time to take a few minutes, huh? Let's just take uh, 15 minutes or whatever it is. When we get back together, we'll get started here.
Okay, let's uh, get started. Do you have any questions before we kind of uh, look at a few slides here? Okay, good. Um, we're going to, the day is going to be kind of spotty and stop and start, but we'll get through it as best we can. Um, I've been talking, you know, for over a day now about this uh, habilitation process and uh, some people, because of their addiction or because of and or uh, early life developmental problems, will have the immaturity of the prefrontal cortex. And I want to try to explain to you uh, one of the ways that I think about modeling treatment. And, you know, because when you look at an alcoholic addict, they generally have problems with affect, problems with relationships. Uh, often uh, some problem solving problems and other things. So if you look at, at the prefrontal cortex, uh, what we'd like to see is better emotional development and affect control. What I'm looking for uh, from a client is first of all for them to be able to tell me how they're feeling and express it. Then I'm going to move from there, can you tell me how another person is feeling that you just talked to. What it, are you picking that up from them? Because um, if you're going to, uh, to be socially astute, you need to be able to pick up on that other person so you don't violate space, you don't, you know, you don't uh, come re go head on into uh, something that turns disastrous. Uh, so if, you, if we started to look at uh, the development, uh, the, you know, the emotional development, the affect control, uh, that's one of the issues. Uh, the, and another one is cognitive development and top-down regulation, uh, making this top of the brain strong enough that it can control the urges and impulses of the lower brain. And then I want to work on the relationship issue, and this is where attachment comes in. Do any of you use attachment uh, with, your, with the people you work with? It's something you might consider. I've got a lot of information I'd be happy to share it with you. And the reason I say that is, is that your attachment style basically determines uh, a lot of the relationships you're going to end up getting into. And it also has a lot to do with your affective or emotional range. So it seems to me that those are kind of important issues. Uh, so I like to, to work in the attachment, let people know where they were, look at their families, uh, what type of style they have, uh, and <clears throat> see what, uh, what can happen is that with certain techniques we can actually take people who have insecure attachments and move them up the rug. You know, we can actually see that healed. The other part of that is being around secure attachments. You know, sponsor, therapist, uh, recovering community, things like that. So, you know, if we, if we look at this, it, it speaks to a lot of the problems that we have. And what I'm talking about now <clears throat> is more of your habilitative uh, types of needs. Because if you have someone with a well-developed prefrontal, let's say it's been knocked offline, it, well, it, all we need to do is get them away from the alcohol and drugs, no meth, no heroin, um, and then we put them in a healthy environment, an enriched environment, so neurogenesis starts to take place, their brain starts to grow, and what I'm looking for over you know, a period of time is to see them as fully functional adults. And I used to see the patients come out of treatment and say, oh, they're so immature, they're not going to make it. Then I started seeing one or two of them a couple of years later at a meeting or something, and they grew up. They grew up. And, and what they had in common was, you know, they, they had good sponsors, you know, they, they were dedicated. And the other thing is a lot of them were offered jobs and, you know, they, it, it, things just started to fall in place for them. And, you know, that's wonderful. But if you don't have a well-developed brain, I mean, this world is hard to deal with with an intact brain. You know, without that, it's, a, it's a, a extremely difficult to, uh, to manage. Now, if we looked at this, and this is just a picture of the brain, you can see maybe this is the back of the brain right there, that's the cerebellum, this is your prefrontal cortex right there, uh, this is your orbital frontal cortex, this is your amygdala, 
Your amygdala is the engine that drives those negative emotions, craving and anger. And if you look at this, it's basically a contest. Which one is most powerful? Is top down more powerful than bottom up? And your emotional development, they say it takes about 32 years uh, for uh, emotional development to be somewhat complete, and that's under good circumstances. So if you think about what we're talking about, we've got people who have a, a very underdeveloped prefrontal cortex, a very overdeveloped amygdala and survival system, because that's the part of their brain they've been using. You see, the, the expense of investing that much into your survival systems uh, means you're taking away from some of your prefrontal you know, development and other things, which takes about 25 years. So whichever one wins out, and usually in the beginning, it's the amygdala and the cravings and everything else that are so strong that we can't uh, top-down control them. Now, if you looked at this, if we just looked at the areas of the prefrontal cortex, and I, 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 there's not going to be a test on this or anything, but uh, the orbital frontal we've talked about, um, it has a lot to do with uh, controlling your feelings. It has a lot to do with weighing decisions, the positives and negatives that we talked about earlier. Uh, the dorsolateral prefrontal, well, let me, let me show you this. This might be helpful to us, I don't know. Uh, well, I'll, I'll make you neurobiologist in about 30 seconds. Let's say this is the left hemisphere and this is the right. And if you know the fins on a fish, you've got most of this accomplished. What's the top fin on a fish called? It probably has a lot of terms, but dorsal is one of them. So dorsal is the top here. Oops, I'm sorry. Dorsal is a little bit aside. Get it right. Let's look at here. Let's say uh, dorsal is fine. Okay. The dorsal fin, and then we have a, a uh, what would we call the bottom fin, a ventral fin maybe? Then we have median, and we have lateral. So as we look at this crudely drawn uh, image of a brain, and uh, you we're thinking left, right, and if I said to you, uh, this is dorsal, lateral, ventral, medial, and uh, this is the right hemisphere, same thing, you know, ventral, dorsal. And if I said to you, where is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex in your right hemisphere? Well, all you got to do is you go to this and you said, okay, right hemisphere, dorsal, lateral, on the and so now what we have is this area of the brain, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, so to speak. And so that sits right up here on both sides. And if you start to, to look at this, for the most part, uh, you know, when you read things like you know, the orbital frontal cortex, it can be a little confusing. But um, you know, if you just think of this little picture of the brain uh, and you get things like uh, the ventromedial, prefrontal cortex, for example, uh, you know, and the ventral, medial, right in here. So it's a kind of a simple little uh, structure that, that sometimes can help you if you're reading research or you're reading uh, things that have uh, descriptions of brain areas in it. What gets confusing is all the circuits, you see. Pathology is more about a circuit dysfunctioning in the brain, not a spot that's not doing well. So if we look at this, the dorsolateral, that's all of your executive functioning. When I said uh, at about 11, you may hear from your kid, um, you know, things aren't fair, Dad. So what happens is you get that reflexive consciousness that we talked about, a different way of seeing the world. And, you know, uh, they look out and they see the world and they see it's not fair. It's not fair. You know, and so uh, when we, we start to look at those sorts of things, the dorsolateral uh, is your executive functioning. This is where a lot of that stuff comes from, the, the ability to be ambiguous, the, diff, you know, the ability uh, to problem solve, 
uh, the ability to, you know, to deal with humor and other things. So the dorsolateral does that for it. Actually, your dorsolateral is where all the words come in. They all come in through here. Actually, they come in on the right side first, and then they're sent to the left side. But the other, the dorsolateral, we were talking about moral injury yesterday. If you look at, uh, at, at the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, it has a lot to do with things like uh, morality. But what the dorsolateral does is it, it is about other people's morality. In other words, uh, we might judge them for uh, their uh, lack of morality. And the other thing is the orbital frontal is where we have uh, moral judgments about me. That's where we beat ourselves up about the decisions we've made. And, and, and so uh, the anterior cingulate, anterior cingulate is an interesting part of the brain because you, you remember the reptiles only had a brain stem, right? They didn't negotiate. They either bit you or they ran. And it was kind of a, that was it. That's all the brain they had. It's very reflexive. And then we developed this, what we call an emotional brain, although it does a lot more things than that. Uh, it, 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 the midbrain or the limbic system, if you like to call it that, um, is just fine. But what happened in evolution, it appears, is that, that there was a band of tissue that grew right over the midbrain, but before the cortex was developed. And when we developed that anterior cingulate, it allowed for pair bonding, families, communities. And so when they look at that, I think a lot about relational sort of issues. Now, the brain, there's a lot of different areas involved in, in just about everything, but uh, if you were to look at it, and uh, I said earlier that I want them to be, be under control more in terms of their emotions and feelings. I want them to be able to weigh and make good decisions. You know, I want them to understand their own feelings and be free to express that. I want them to uh, be able to read the feelings in others, you know, uh, and, and use that uh, in their socialization process. So, you know, if we uh, look at, at, you know, this anterior cingulate, it, it, it created this the detachment, the ability to attach to others, a social cohesion, if you will. Uh, and uh, along with that, it, it, it does things like it helps you focus your attention on where it should be focused. You know, that's a developmental piece too. You know, uh, the children and even adolescents sometimes have real difficult time maintaining focus on something, picking out the most salient things, the most important things, and, and you know, uh, single-mindedly work on them. Uh, but I think that <clears throat> what happened, you know, with the anterior cingulate was we built this whole cortex on top of it. And the cortex is like a big computer. This is the who, what, where, why, and when of everything. Uh, and what, uh, you know, with the uh, onset of the uh, prefrontal cortex, the brain is still evolving, by the way. It's, it's, it's uh, still evolving. And, uh, you know, so when we look at these things, I, I'm really looking at attachment. I'm looking at, at them being able to have some sophisticated cognitive skills that would allow them to, uh, to hold a job, for example. Uh, and uh, I want them to be able to manage their affect uh, quite a bit better. Uh, and so uh, when they look at this, it really is telling me that, that these parts of the brain that have been knocked offline or that are immature because of development, you know, uh, if we don't fix those over time, if they don't grow into themselves, uh, we're going to have someone who's going to be very impaired as an adult. They're not going to be able to do adult-like things. Uh, uh, their, their commitment is going to be shaky. Their follow-through is going to be shaky. They're still all about me, you know? And so I, 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 one of the models that I sometimes use is this neurobiological model. And then what I do is I come up with interventions that are based on uh, what might be helpful in growing that particular part of the brain. Uh, you know, if you uh, looked at, uh, at some of these things, uh, for example, with your executive functioning prefrontal cortex, your safe environment, 
therapeutic relationship. Physical exercise helps. But when you're starting to look at, at something like this, um, this is without those executive functioning. Um, and a lot of that is the ability to control impulses and urges from the lower brain. Uh, we're not going to do uh, very well. Uh, so I think that if we looked at this, gave it some consideration, and it kind of break it down like this. You say, uh, it, this comes from a study uh, from a symposium that was put on about five years ago at the New York Academy of Sciences. It was a real fascinating couple of days. They were talking about resilience and they were talking about a number of different things. Uh, and uh, what they, they, they did was they did studies, uh, especially looking at adolescents and young adults. And the studies were to determine what could we help them with through treatment, what, what, what areas could we help them with? And what they came up with is that we could help them with their relationships, peer and parental, that we could help them control affect a little bit better, you know, and on top of that, uh, you know, we could, we could see them, uh, you know, gain a lot of executive skills, top-down skills, uh, being able to weigh uh, the good and the bad, all of these things um, are, are part and parcel of these parts of the brain. So what I did was design certain strategies that, for example, might, uh, you know, help grow the anterior cingulate. Remember the formula that the area you pay attention to grows. So I'm going to do a lot of things here. For example, with, with the cognition, um, anything you do there, jigsaw puzzles, uh, you know, crossword puzzles, uh, we used to do it as competitions between groups of patients. It gives it a little jazz, you know, and uh, uh, it, uh, you know, it, it works out pretty well. Cognitive therapy works. Anything you do that challenges your brain, reading, all of those things are helpful here, you know. And so uh, when we start to, to look at this, there's things that we can do to help a person uh, deal with anger a little more effectively. There's a lot of techniques that can be used uh, that uh, we can help them with and uh, uh, we can practice. Uh, for example, with anger, um, uh, if when you look anger, most people who are angry would like to displace it or stuff it. And by displacing it, you just talk to a bunch of people about it until you've kind of gotten all the emotion out. The stuffing is uh, trying to just stuff it down so we don't have to feel it and deal with it. Um, out of contemplative Christianity, which is my origin, um, uh, it, uh, we, there's a technique called welcoming prayer that is really, um, you know, it's, it's intuitive, but it, it's, it, 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 it's exactly opposite of what most people would do with anger. And we call it welcoming prayer. And it goes like this, it says, uh, you know, when you feel the anger, uh, without going too far in this, the first thing that you experience is a sensation. And these are caused by your neurotransmitters, dopamine, serotonin, you know, uh, you know uh, and norepinephrine. And this sensation um, uh, is somewhat equivalent to what I would call the emotion and what happens in this is when you put words to that. In other words, cognitive stuff. I don't know why that person did this to me. I'm such a good person. You know, logic systems have a few chunks and they, rep they repeat or they go into another system. And once we start putting words into it, you'll start to feel the feelings, if you will, of anger. Think about it. You'll have a sensation, but until you put the words to it, I'm so angry, I don't know why that person did that. And the more you do that, the angrier you're going to get, right? It's just an internal cycle. These things feed off of one another. And in the feeding off of one another, uh, what it does, it makes it worse. And so now you can't sleep at night. And I mean, I work with people who have resentments from 30 years ago and some family members or families or something else. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I don't know if this question fits in this part, but <clears throat> since we're here for addictions and sensations, and what I've heard from the people that I work that use meth is that 
that first high is so wonderful that that's what that can never be achieved again. Mm -hmm. And so that's what they're looking for. Um, it's it's always been spoken of in the, you know in addictions, no matter what the drug is, uh, the phenomenon that you that you talk about. Um, what happens is is that uh, we chase that sweet spot. And we, we, as we escalate dose, we get more toxicity, less sweet spot, you know. But drug seeking is pushing, just pushing it, driving it. And, uh, but uh, hey, you're right, you're right. I mean, that, that, uh, uh, that uh, experience is so profound for uh, some people. It was for me. First time I did cocaine was uh, in a farmhouse outside Fredericksburg, Virginia in probably 1968 something like that. And uh, we'd been up all night drinking and partying and we, had, we were cooking a big pig for the next day. I mean, we were so burnt out by the next day uh, we could hardly participate. But, you know, I, I, I remember it, it was maybe about three in the morning and a friend of mine had some cocaine and we were smoking dope and he says, well, come on in. I said, I'll give you a line. I said, sure, yeah, give it a try. And because uh, it wasn't hot back then, it was not something you saw. Uh, and when I did the first couple lines of cocaine, I walked out and I looked out across the fields and I said, God, where has this been all my life? This is the way I've always wanted to feel and I never wanted to end. And that, that was a profound experience. You know, and it, uh, it, uh, it just as you said, it, it, it left its mark. It left its mark. And see, I, I really think that, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, that, that this whole thing with drugs is uh, uh, the right direction, wrong method. I think what we're trying to do is to feel whole, to feel connected, to be okay. You know, I used to, I, I used to want to be invisible, and I could do it. About, I can remember if I drank enough and did enough cocaine, about by four or five in the morning, I could be invisible. And I could walk out and go to bars in Chicago. They're always open. And you, you could be absolutely invisible. Nobody can touch you. I mean, the weird stuff that happens is just incredible. But, you know, this model is just a, it's, it's a practical model, but it's more of a neurobiological model. But it, 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 it hits on key areas that we have to deal with. And these areas uh, are part and parcel of the development of the prefrontal cortex. So as we look at this, we can see the relationships, the uh, feeling control and everything uh, going on there. So what I was starting to tell you about is a little bit about, uh, you know, welcoming prayer and how these things work. And you see, with welcoming prayer, what I say when, when, when I start to feel anger is I say, anger, come on in. Come on in. Be with me. Just be with me. Don't say a word, just let it sit. In 60 to 90 seconds, all of the neurotransmitters involved in that anger are going to float away, be degraded. And if you don't say a word, you'll probably end up in the, in the uh, moment in your right hemisphere. Uh, once you start putting words to it, uh, the feelings, the anger escalates. And we have to deal with that a little differently. And your basic strategy here is to get away from internal cycling and get them to focus outward. Sort of like when a person has a brief psychotic break or something. I, I had a, a lady in a trauma group and she stood up and she said, it's my father, it's my father, he's coming through the door, her father was the abuser. Of course, her father wasn't coming through the door, but, you know, and so with her, you know, take off your shoes, feel the floor, feel my hands and give them a lot of tactile stimulation, a lot of visual, look in my eyes, the only two uh, real things here are you and me, and, uh, and, and it kind of talked her down from that, but you know, what I did was to get her to focus externally, feel the floor, my hands, look in my eyes, uh, otherwise what I would want to do in situations where the emotion is escalating is to uh, get this person to do something that takes them out of the internal cycling. It's called grounding in mental health. It's basically grounding. 
take a walk, go to a meeting, call somebody, get out your three by five index card, um, whatever you need to do, um, take a walk with the dog. Uh, these things will basically interrupt it. We can also do self-regulation strategies, cognitive behavioral things. And uh, just one more thing about anger, because anger is very interesting to me. Um, I mentioned yesterday it's kind of a dominant emotion and that uh, I think that a lot of anger uh, comes from love because you know what I find in any relationship is when the love is gone there's not much there to build on is it but you know if uh, if we have people who still care for each other they probably still getting angry at each other and getting upset at each other I, I can work with that but when they've reached a point where they've just shut it off they won't want to deal with it um, then it's pretty much a, a, a tough road. Um, I sometimes I would tell couples that really, I you could really tell they loved each other. They just, I mean, they're nonverbal stuff. They're, you know, into each other. And they're telling me all the reasons that they, that they came up with why they should separate. And I, I looked at them, and I, this is something I do on rare occasions, but if I thought it was the right thing. And I said, you know, I don't want you folks to spend a whole lot of money on therapists. Uh, I don't think you need to. I think that you've already come up with all the reasons why you should get a divorce and do it right now. <laughs> you know what they'll do? Our brains are oppositional. They will try to tell me all the reasons that maybe they should stay together, which prompts me to say, you know, maybe I misread this. Maybe there is something here to really build on. Now I've got a little momentum going. Um, you know, and uh, they basically admitted <clears throat> that, you know, that, uh, that, that, that there's uh, things that they can work out and that maybe we can salvage this p particular relationship. Um, so, in <clears throat> looking at this, there's all sorts of things. One other little piece is when you're working with someone who's really angry and upset, you know, they might be in your detox or whatever, uh, and uh, the thing that... Uh, See, with a lot of the meth addicts, they're just so wasted when they get in that, you know. But, uh, you know, you, you look at, 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 at some of these scenarios. If you've got someone, let's just say, I had this 15-year-old, and he, he's forced to come to see me by his parents, and uh, he, was, uh, he, was, he was messing up a few things, and his, his, his the referral was for anger. The guy was really angry. And the, the interesting thing about this is that his opening uh, ploy was, my mother is always angry at me. See, I love to affirm. What I've learned long ago is that if you affirm people, you get their attention. Uh, for example, when my son was young and he would do his math homework, he would, out of the ten questions, he would get through six or seven and do beautifully, and then he would just kind of slide on the rest. Well, a six, seven-year-old, if I, if, I, if I looked at my son, his name was Camden, and I said, Camden, what's wrong with you? You know, you know how to do these problems. You know, were you just lazy? Well, what's he going to do? He's going to run in the other room, cry, not going to talk to me. But if I look at him and I say, Camden, you are so smart. You did such a beautiful job. These first six, seven problems, you nailed them. Couldn't have been any better. But why don't you look at seven through 10 and see if you come up with the, the same answers the next time. I got a shot at that, see? I've got a shot at a person being compliant that way and taking the body is important. So if I've got someone who's coming at me with my mother's always angry, you can't go toe to toe with this. Because if I say, oh, no, your mother can't always be angry at you. Oh, yes, she is. She's always angry. I mean, it usually gets worse. So you've got to come through the side door a little bit. And this is a, called a cognitive reframe. See, I've got to get a, a client to see things in a way that allow me to work with them. For example, someone who has obsessive compulsive disorder and says to me, that if I don't wash my hands almost continuously, I'm going to catch the AIDS virus. Well, 
There's no intervention that's going to work on that mindset unless you can convince your patient that you've gotten rid of all the AIDS virus in the world. So what I have to do is reframe that in a way that's workable. So what I do is I do the reframe, and the reframe is you have a disorder that makes your brain believe all of these things. So the problem is not the AIDS virus. The problem is here. And if I can get them to go with me there, now it opens up all sorts of possibilities, uh, you know, from therapeutic perspectives as well as uh, pharmacology. But with this mother's angry at me, I, I just come through a side door and I affirm. I say something like this. I say, you know, it is just hard to imagine, you know, how, how someone for 15 years could live with a person who is always angry at them. I said, geez, that must be really tough. Of course, I kind of got him a little bit now. We're, we're, we're okay. And then what I, I'm going to ask him is, do you mean to tell me every second of all these 15, so I got my calculator, 15 times 365, do you mean to tell me every moment of all 5,475 days you've been on this earth, your mother's been angry at you? They'll just about always say, oh, no, not always. You know, if they say, yep, she always is, well, you can deal with that, too. Just say, um, well, why does it still surprise you and go to plan B? Okay. But uh, in working with, uh, with, uh, with this, most of the time they'll say something, well, not every moment, not all the time. That's all I wanted. I needed a crack in the wall. And so I'll play off of that, and I'll say, well, tell me one time you and your mother really got along. Things were cool. Well, we went to the beach and things like that, and she's pretty cool. Now you, you, the hook is set. Um, what do you need to do to have more times like that with your mother? Which starts to get us pretty close to school grades, the fact she found marijuana in your bedroom, and, and what the problems really are. But uh, it's really tough to go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Uh, reframes work very well. All you got to do is think of of uh, used car salesmen, insurance salesmen, and you know what a reframe is. They're wonderful at it. You go, you go to, to buy a car and you know exactly how much you're going to spend. And you've been doing this budget for a while. And so you go in and what happens is that, you, uh, that the first experience uh, that you have is a car salesman taking you and putting you in a car that's much more expensive than the one you can afford, right? They're so slick they actually program in the stations you know, while you're in the car. And then they say, it's a shame you can't, af can't afford this beauty. And we're oppositional, so some of us will say, the hell, I can't afford this. We'll buy the darn thing and go off the lot with buyer's remorse, right? Uh, and it, with insurance, it, it's, it's this pitch, life insurance. This is not for you. This is for your family and for your children. So in other words, I'm going to put you in a position where you have to tell me you don't care for your family to say no to my policy. And it's just slick. I mean, uh, but a lot of those things can be used uh, clinically. I'm going to bow out now and turn it back over to Ed here. Okay, as we, as we announced, if you need an accurate agenda, take real good notes, and at the end you'll have one. Right? <laughs> okay, we're going to uh, take a, a little pause in our agenda and uh, add, uh, add an item or two. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Tiffany Wolfgang. She's the director of South Dakota Community Behavioral Health. And it used to be substance abuse and then uh, mental health and uh, you know, there they, they, they used to be an old saying, welcome to South Dakota, set your clock back 10 years. <laughs> but uh, um, community behavioral health is the, the, the integration of those two services. And Tiffany is the director of that. And I've uh, got to know her through uh, professional dealings, especially over the last year and a half. And uh, she, she's an ally, my perspective, for the meth treatment program. And she has a, a sensitivity to the culture and how we do things in Indian country. Uh, that shines through very brightly. So I was just gonna ask her if she would uh, share a few words on behalf of her department. 
Thanks, Ed, and I really truly appreciate those words. Those are very meaningful to me. Um, I do have a passion for the work that we do. Like he indicated, my name is Tiffany Wolfgang. I'm the Division Director of Behavioral Health. We have the fortunate opportunity to be the oversight of the publicly funded behavioral health system in South Dakota. So that means we work with 50 accredited uh, behavioral health providers across South Dakota to provide behavioral health services but we're also the direct providers inside the prison system. So I think we really have that ability to see both sides of the equation. <coughs> As Dr. Nichols was talking, I was thinking, public speaking is one of my least favorite things to do, so I'll have to start grounding myself here real quickly <laughs> before I start to pass out. But I also understand how important it is, and I really, truly do love to talk about what we do. Um, I think most of what, what makes a difference in the world that we work in is relationships and communication. We are here to talk, we're here to listen. Um, I know Ed, we've been in conversations for quite a while and if it was up to Ed and I, something would be happening. <laughs> but sometimes we don't have that luxury. Um, I'm always open, my office, my door is always open to listen to folks if you have ideas, if you have thoughts. We work hard in South Dakota to use our publicly funded dollars as wisely as we can. I'm passionate about access. I'm passionate about outcomes. I want to make a difference for those individuals. I tell my staff, these aren't just people that we don't know. These are our brothers, our mothers, our fathers, our sisters, our cousins who need us. I want to make sure that help is there for them. The same help I'd want if it was my mom, my dad, or my brother. So with that, do I, any questions? I'm much better at questions than I am just talking. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Oh, my phone number is 605-367-5236. Then you get this wonderful voicemail system, but if you press zero, it'll take you to the operate, to my secretary. Yep, yep, so I'm the director of behavioral health for the state, Tiffany Wolfgang. And I can grab you a card too if you need one. As Ed said, a lot of what we're working on is with intensive meth treatment, so I was really happy to hear what was going on here. Another big project that we have is with opioids. So we have our opioid booth back there. We have funding for training, education, supporting those kind of things across South Dakota. So just give me a call and we can talk through the options. Uh, just, uh, uh, just real briefly, uh, through Tiffany's office, the Rosebud Sioux Tribe Meth Rehabilitation Program has been offered a contract with the state of South Dakota uh, to be the third meth-specific uh, residential treatments program in South Dakota. But um, um, state and tribal relations has always been a little bumpy, rocky, challenging at times, and there's language in the contract that, uh, that needs to be worked out. So for the last year and a half, uh, we've been working on that. Um, to this current administration's um, credit, this started back in 2007, and the state did not budge on anything that was obviously a problem in the contract. The contract fits anywhere in South Dakota except on a reservation. Their considerations need to be taken into account. They have never been taken into consideration. There are three deal breakers in the contract. Two of them have been overcome. We have negotiated language in the contract. It's, uh, the third one is uh, huge, but I, I didn't get to talk to you, Layat, so uh, can, we, can we talk now? Um, the tribe's attorney general met with the South Dakota attorney general's office. They sat down at the table, and I'm, I'm waiting for the summary of that, but I heard that a compromise has been made. So the potential for this contract is, is very, very real. Yeah, you can give a hand for that one. That's a... Uh, yeah, so uh, 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 before the language was all disputes will be resolved in Hughes County um, State Court and this contract is exclusively under state law. <laughs> not, not that I'm opposed to state law, but you understand that, right? Indian country, there's a 638 programs and federal law that comes into play. So the compromise was state law or federal court and then we're covered. So if everybody can agree to that, this contract is going to go forward. So, yeah. Yep. Um, we also have, uh, yes? Wolfgang, that's a Lakota, 
No. <laughs> From her husband. It sounds a little, what, what's your eth ethnicity? It's, yeah. German. Hello. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, some of us are thinking Lakota. Oh, she's married to a wolf gang. <laughs> okay. Um, our our um, other distinguished guest, I guarantee you, he's not going to pass out when we hand him the mic. Um, but we have our very privileged um, Dusty Johnson's office reached out to Marcita Eagle Bear, and he's going to be here with counsel today. And he wanted to come to the RST alcohol drug treatment program and also tour the meth treatment program. So he's here today. As soon as we're done with this, we're going to go over and and do the nickel tour. So we're, we're delighted, excited to have him with us. And with that, I'm going to ask him if he'd share a few words from. Well, I, I just want to pick up where Tiffany left off because I thought her comments um, were fantastic about the fact that uh, we need to treat uh, these folks like they're our brothers or cousins or fathers. At least for me, that's literally true. I mean, I come from a family that uh, has struggled with addiction. You know, that was certainly a major part of my growing up, you know, was understanding that uh, alcohol had really wrapped its arms around my father, and he was in an incredible struggle, and that created a lot of challenges, uh, you know, for all five of us kids as we were growing up. And you guys know more about addiction than I do, but I just know there were times when a young Dusty Johnson wasn't entirely sure what the way forward looked like uh, for our family. And it was uh, people uh, in treatment and out of treatment who for years, people who are in the kind of line of work that you are in, who helped our family find the way forward. And I know that you all love your jobs, and I know you know that you're changing lives every day, but if there is ever a moment where you doubt that, I just got to tell you, my life has been changed by people like you. My brothers' and sisters' lives have been changed by people who are in your line of work. My father's life, my mother's life, I mean, even if it's just one poor family of seven from Fort Pier, there have been lives changed because folks cared. And they gave people a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, that doesn't mean that there's not a role for Washington, D.C. Of course there is. We, of course, need more resources. This is a national epidemic. This is a demon that uh, you know, caused 70,000 people to overdose between opioids and meth and coke last year at 70,000 lives that were lost. Too many of them uh, in this country, of course, and of course too many of them in Indian country. So I want to be a partner. Uh, this is on my heart for my personal experiences. Uh, I want to be a partner with you uh, as you move forward to try to make people who are struggling uh, try to find their way forward to continue to be healthy families and members of healthy communities. And if you ever have an idea about what we can be doing in Washington, to make your job easier. I know you're saving lives and I want to help. Uh, I would just close by mentioning uh, Katie Murray over there. Katie is our West River Director. She works out of the Rapid City office and uh, she's a lot nicer than I am. So if you, have, <laughs> if you have a question, you can ask me or you can ask Katie and we're happy to help. So thanks very much for your time. And, and like Tiffany, I'd take a question or two or three if, uh, if we've got time, Ed. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Um, we wanted to start. I'm at Rapid City CHR. Uh, we wanted just to help the community start healing. I think that the core of healing the people begins in the community, not in programs or like alcohol rehabilitation and stuff. It has to start with the community. The community has to heal first, because you can put a person into a drug treat drug treatment place or hospital, or whatever, but you put them back into the community that made them that way. Mm -hmm. So you need to start healing the community. One of our ideas was to p help start uh, cultural practices in our communities. That is like into the housings, uh, put sweat lodges in men and female sweat lodges in each community to, uh, and then we'll go out and start teaching them about the Lakota, how the sweat lodge ceremony began and have the children put the sweat lodges up and, mm. you know, you start from there, you know, because it has to start somewhere and maybe that's, you know, that, that's a small step and that way the children will know um, where, they, where they come from. 
and yeah. what, what, what are the traditional, what are our culture, all this, the identity, because you see a lot of gang-related incidences, and a lot of it is because the children don't know where they're actually from. Well, I think that's beautiful and absolutely accurate. And I'm a real evidence-based, data-driven guy, and you all and Tiffany no doubt know a lot more about what the evidence says than I do. But my understanding of the evidence really supports you know, the values you just espoused. Um, you know, when I was chief of staff to the governor, I mean, at that time, 80% of the people that we were sentencing to prison in this state were nonviolent offenders. That overwhelmingly meant drug offenders. And part of why we were doing it is because we felt like, well, these people need treatment, so we got treatment in prison, sent them there. And the facts are that prison is not a particularly good place to get treatment. It's not a particularly effective place to get treatment because you're right, community resources are really needed. It is relatively easy to stay clean in prison because around every corner is not somebody who's willing to sell you something. And so if you, if it's only external controls in prison that are keeping you straight, then when you're released back into the community, we haven't helped you build the internal controls necessary to say no, hour by hour, day by day, and we all know recovery is not a straight line. And if you've got a community that can wrap itself around you and a culture that can help you see the way forward, that is going to make your, your failures, uh, your relapses a lot easier to recover from. So everything you're saying makes complete sense to me. And we've reformed the criminal justice system in South Dakota, not as much as we need to, but enough so we're not sending anywhere near as many drug offenders to prison just so they can get treatment there. I'm just so excited to, you know, as a congressman, normally you show up at the place and they throw rocks at you. So I'm really excited everybody is in such a good mood today. We're, of course, going to be available if there's something we can do to help or questions later as well. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Dr. Knuckles, you want to continue on and take us into, into lunch where we're you know, if it goes a little beyond, that's perfectly okay because uh, Tree of Life Ministry is going to be serving lunch again, but I see they're not here yet, so lunch will be served. Um, Bill Cha. started what we what we're trying to do I think is integrate a lot of what we talked into yesterday into a, a clinical way of thinking about what we're trying to do and uh, develop uh, certain types of techniques and skills that will allow a person to grow and I think we've talked about the essential ingredients of that um, you know the uh, safe emergency the a healing environment, um, the therapeutic relationship. Uh, the therapeutic relationship is such a powerful thing. Um, see, I run into clinicians who are very good technicians. They know cognitive behavioral therapy or EMDR or whatever it is, up one side and down the other, but they, don't, they can't connect with their patients and they get very poor compliance. But if you reach out, your heart reaches out to that client and touches them, uh, they can feel you uh, in your presence, and you can make that connection, which we call a therapeutic relationship. And within that relationship, uh, you know, a, a lot of growth can take place. Let me just, from a clinician's side, let me show you something that I've always found to be very helpful. Uh, if you look at, uh, I guess, uh, any particular model that you like, 
and you start to think about some approach that you would like to use. But when we talk about this therapeutic relationship, and we talk about 40 years of research, what it says is that you're the agent of change. You're the most important part of the formula. Because who you are and your personage, your, your spiritual essence, uh, however you would like to say it, um, makes a difference. It's also healing. You know, it's very healing. And uh, what happens in uh, these types of relationships is that uh, often, you, you may have noticed this, that sometimes when you're, uh, the person you're working with has really done nice work, and let's say you hug each other after the, uh, after the session, uh, what that touch does is cause a lot of oxytocin to be kicked out. Oxytocin is a feel-good chemical, but it also tends to facilitate trust and other things. After, uh, uh, after sex, you know, both parties get a big jolt of oxytocin. That's what makes you feel close. And, you know, after, uh, after you've uh, experienced a sexual encounter. And so when we look at, at something like this, and we're trying to figure out, you know, what's really going on here. So we've got the therapist and another one of those emaciated crack addicts. But, you know, uh, if you look at this, and we've got a client over here, and we start talking about what we have in our brain. See, just about all stuff is survival oriented. That's why your, your brain has a negative valence. It tends to move, you know, to, to go to the negative. It's just all survival. They, there was a study that said in a relationship, if you do one bad thing to your spouse, it takes about five good things to get even or something like that. I don't know how they figured that all out. But say, so what I want to do is, as a, as a clinician, is I want to get a feel for this client. And I may have some history, I may have seen them before, but when they walk into the room, and a lot of these were trauma survivors, I have to be always careful uh, not to be thinking about the last client or doing something like this, because see, they, they don't read faces well. They'll jump to conclusions, especially your borderlines, they will uh, basically look at you and say, I, I hear you're angry at me, want to talk about it? And what they do is they're interpreting your face. You, you have an area in your brain called the fusiform face area that reads other people just like that. And so when we start to think about that, what I want to be is either uh, a smile or, or neutral. And what I'm trying to do is to get a sense of this particular client. And what we have in our brain is a system called the mirror neuron system. I don't know if you're aware of this. It was discovered in 1996 by a, an Italian researcher by the name of Rizzolotti. He comes in, he's got a gelato, a little ice cream cone, and he's got all these monkeys, and they're hooked up to electrodes in their brain. And so he comes in and he starts to take, you know, bites of the ice cream. And as every bite he takes, the monkeys are doing this. This is also, uh, if, it's, if the mirror neurons are close to your motor cortex, this is imitation. This is part of how we learn. Dad has a little infant and he throws the ball, rolls the ball to him. It's the mirror neuron system in that little infant's head that tries to coordinate that. So that the baby's trying to imitate that. First time he might conk themselves in the head or something, but over time they get it. And uh, this is a, a, you know, a part of a, you know, imitation and learning. The other thing that happens here in the mirror neuron system is it allows us to feel what another person is feeling. It also allows us to think about what another person is thinking. You know, for example, if someone uh, it comes to the door there and they got a pistol in their hand and they're, they, they, they won't break eye contact with me. My brain needs to be thinking, I need to get the heck out of here or do something to survive. Uh, and again, it's all survival oriented, but this feeling, peace that we get, if you just open yourself up to it, you're also reading all the nonverbal behavior. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to feed it back to them as close to their own words as I can, but I want to summarize 
uh, you know, what they're saying. For example, this client comes in, and this is Joe, and uh, Joe, uh, you know, just seems to be a little flat. His nonverbal behavior is such, the way he's talking, walking. And so I might say, you know, Joe, seems like things are going, uh, you know, not so well for you today. I, I get a sense that you're, uh, that you're having, str you're struggling with your feelings. And uh, what I'm doing is basically feeding this back to him and what is called as empathy. A vital part of the therapeutic relationship. In a study where they had the clients rate therapists based on uh, empathy, they rated therapists that talk too much as lowest in empathy. The ability to listen is a skill. It really is. When I got started, I, and I was so self-critical and perfectionistic that you know, if I didn't feel like much was happening in the session, I would educate them about something so I felt like I did my job, you know. And it, it, uh, it, this, this whole skill set of becoming comfortable in yourself and, and, and feeling that patient is an area that I think modern medicine has gotten us away from. You know, if you sit down, if you're a psychiatrist and you sit down and you got someone, you know, who is a little neurotic, you start to think about what medicine to give them uh, or what therapy to use. What that does is it kind of insulates us from feeling the pain that the patient is feeling. And I think it's, from my perspective, it's necessary for me to be able to feel the other person's pain. Uh, it, 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 you've got to have some healthy habits to kind of counteract it. I always had a therapist that I used. Um, and or if you have a good staff, you can sit down or a colleague to talk to. But, you know, my sense is, is that in all of these things, just to be a good listener, to be there. I, I, I really think that so many uh, people who have sat in, in a chair opposite me were, were, were wondering if I was going to really be there for them, if I was going to really listen to them, you know, or if I'm going to judge them like other people, especially people who in and out of the criminal justice system, they're constantly, uh, you know, aware of what they say because they don't want to say anything that could cause them some problems. But, uh, you know, when we start to, to, to look at it on this level, um, this is a, a lot of the basis of the therapeutic relationship, that, that chemistry that develops between us uh, that is energetic, you know, uh, and uh, it's right hemisphere to right hemisphere sort of, of energetics. And so when we start to, to look at this, there's a lot of things that are going on that are kind of beneath the radar that can be very helpful to us, you know, just in terms of how we engage people. If you have a, a good sense of yourself, if you uh, have a good spiritual program, you will touch people. You will touch people. You will change them. You know, and it's, uh, uh, it, it, with that, uh, you, your technique doesn't have to be quite so shiny. See, people have beautiful technique but can't establish a therapeutic relationship um, will have patients who won't be compliant. But if you can establish the relationship, often uh, the person will take the body. And the whole notion of take the body and the mind shall follow. You know, uh, they tend to be more compliant. The relationship is important to them. They're, they're getting something out of it on multiple levels. And so when we, we start to think about this, the mirror neuron system kind of kicks in for us. Any questions about any of this so far or anything you want to kick around further? Well, let me make sure that I, I understand. You were talking about things like codependency yeah. and other things and ha children. how they might affect the brain. Yeah, and then like if you're born, let's say a uh, mother or something was a covered uh, addict and she was pregnant. And mm -hmm. The baby was born, okay, is this going to, as a 
it's uh, harder for their areas of the brain to develop from mm -hmm. the addiction. Mm -hmm. And then the children from when the parents are recovering, is it, is it harder for them to is it, uh, affect their brain to codependency and mm -hmm. stuff like that? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, the, study show? Yeah, the, the question, uh, it actually is a couple questions in there, I think. Um, you know, it, but uh, I think that, that when we talk about things like codependency, you'll often see developmental problems there. I mean, and, uh, and development of a, of a self that can be, um, that can make its own decisions and decide its own way. Uh, if you look at narcissism, codependency is the opposite side of the mirror from narcissism. Uh, this one needs to mirror, this one needs to be mirrored. It's, uh, I, I like some of Shel Silverstein's books. Uh, I, the, the one that he, he wrote that I particularly like is uh, the story of Gimme Some Roy, which is a great story about this uh, addict looking for the perfect high. And, uh, but he has another little book called uh, The Big O Meets the Missing Piece. And it's about a circle that had like a pizza, had a slice out of it. So you've got this person who doesn't feel like they're whole. And this happens quite a lot. So they go out and try to you know, get involved with someone who fills in that missing piece to try to make themselves whole. Uh, this is not uncommon. So they find that piece, he finds that piece, or she does. Now it's whole, feels whole, rolls around, does well, problem is that this piece starts to grow and it no longer fits anymore and really it's a neat little uh, kind of thing that you can use in therapeutic relationships for example uh, but uh, the, the point uh, of this was that uh, a relationship consists of two people who are you know who are whole so to speak and there's my area and there's your area and I have to have trust in you uh, you have to have trust in me that we won't violate the tenets of our relationship and then there's an area called us that can tend to expand but it, you know if you have people who uh, are not whole so to speak like in codependency whose, whose feelings are based upon you know the perception of others uh, and trying to live up to things that they can't live up to. Uh, this is a, a, what a nice relationship tends to look like. And the codependency piece uh, really is, uh, uh, you know, is the opposite extreme, if you will, or opposite side of the mirror of narcissism. So I would think that, that in this, because of the environment that codependency is developed in, I would think we would see some similar types of changes if they weren't parented effectively, for example, and things like that. So I think you're pretty intuitive and right on about that. I, I can't tell you exactly what they are. I, I'm sure there's some studies out there that have looked at this. I just am not real familiar with them. Yes, ma'am? Is there a study that uh, looks out there about uh, codependency existing back in the day? And are there? Oh, we never talked about it, but sure. Now, historically, it's been been around for a long time, I suppose, you know. Um, I don't think so. Well, see, some of it, in a way, you have to kind of look at because uh, uh, sometimes a, a female's role, for example, is caregiver, uh, giving of oneself. And sometimes that can be confused with codependency, but it is uh, uh, culturally the way things go you know, the way things are. Um, but uh, I, I, I don't know of any research right offhand that uh, I could point you to there. I'm not real familiar with codependency and mm -hmm. all of that, but I am familiar with our traditional cultural way of life, and it's like something I'm thinking we didn't tolerate. Mm. Yeah. Well, tell me more, you, you didn't tolerate codependency? Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't, we didn't support it, we didn't, um, 
we didn't encourage it, we didn't um, let it happen. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that it, during that air time, in our earlier time, uh, that there was no such thing as ACOAism, uh, adult right. children stuff. That really came in probably in the 80s, maybe 90s, it really proliferated, but 80s, maybe late 70s even, we saw some of that. So there was never any diag you know, definition or diagnosis for it. It was not a recognized syndrome. It was people like uh, Claudia Black and Bob Ackerman and others who got that old ACOA movement going. Well, and, uh, what I was trying to get at is um, somebody here was talking about that. We already know this. We already know these things. If we go back to our traditional cultural teachings, we already know how to handle our but um, for some reason, we don't think we can do that. But um, this lady here who was talking about our community, that's how we did things back in the day. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that things were a lot different. For example, in the 50s, you truly had communities. Yeah. Uh, well, we truly had communities. Uh, you know, I, I miss seeing people out on their front porch. Uh, I, when I was growing up, you couldn't get away with anything. Everybody knew your business, um, which was kind of good, but pretty bad at that point in time. Uh, so I, I think that the way communities are built today, uh, we don't have the extended families like we used to. People have moved away, and uh, we've, we've lost contact quite often. Uh, so I think it makes it, you know, that the, the social system, as we know it, has changed quite a bit. And in my mind, not for the better, really. Uh, for the worse, we just don't have, you know, it, when I was growing up, I, everybody was my mother, you know, in the whole neighborhood, I could go into any house just about and, and get a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you know, and, uh, you know, I could go uh, and go out and make a mess, and, you know, maybe some other uh, mom gave me a whipping for that. I never forget, I was nine years old, got my first BB gun, and you know, back then we were concerned with the Russians, you know, the red menace. And so I got this BB gun, and I don't know how I arrived at this. Uh, uh, I, I started to I think that maybe that it was my responsibility to keep the communists out of my neighborhood. And now that I was armed, I felt pretty prepared for that. So I went up to a house that they were building, a new house, and a big pile of red clay, and I, I laid up there with my BB gun and, and blew out all the doors in a French window, or a French door, and took all the panes out. I figured that with a show of artillery like that, Russians would be pretty hesitant to come into my neighborhood. And so I'm heading home, I'm pretty proud, got my gun. Two mothers gave me a whipping. I hadn't even got home yet. Now they'd call that abuse. <laughs> The things that then I remember I, I was drunk before I could walk. I would steal drinks. I, I don't remember it. I was told about it. And I, they said I would, uh, I was just a toddler. I couldn't walk yet. And I would steal drinks. And they say I would sit in the middle of the floor with this big grin on my face. Uh, maybe uh, maybe there's a couple clues that I was going to have some problems, you know. And uh, they thought it was the funniest thing to watch me sit there drunk on the floor. <laughs> and today we would call it child abuse, you know. Uh, it, it, there's different standards, uh, uh, different ways we're looking at things. Uh, and uh, I, I think that uh, we've lost uh, a, some degree of that integrity of the family, uh, you know, of those relationships. Uh, and so uh, I would think that uh, all of that has a little something to do with uh, some of the difficulties we see. Um, the other, I guess, uh, let me ask you, is there any other questions that you have about this? Because I'm going to probably uh, jump into something a little different here in a few minutes. Yes?
wonderful. Just a suggestion, you know, if Thank you. you. want to know, and um, we're back in September, and, and a lot of codependents, I'm yeah. the facilitator, I do the codependency, and uh, a lot of it is, uh, codependents are so serious all the time. <laughs> we don't let down they easy. do, do, do for everybody, and they get lost, you know. So we go up there, we just have fun, huh? <laughs> Mm-hmm. Good <laughs> we deal. Go up there and we just have, I mean, we teach you different techniques, what you want, you know, what you want to do, and, and have fun. Yeah. So it's kind of like a routine, you know, too, for you, mm-hmm. you know, just to help you, the helpers. Help mm-hmm. I thank you. Oh, that's great. Uh, and, and if anybody else knows of uh, some healing work that's going on, uh, please uh, let everybody know so we so we can utilize the resources we have in the community. Um, it's, uh, you know, a lot of times we, we can't provide all the services, so we need, I always say, good Rolodex. I guess today it's all on your phone, but you need to be able to reach out to people that can, that can kind of extend uh, what you're trying to do. Any other uh, questions, any comments over here? We, are we good? Pardon? Okay, does Ed want to break now? Okay. Well, I, I just uh, uh, became aware that uh, that lunch is ready, and so I think probably it's a good time to uh, to have some lunch. What do you think? Uh, we'll take about an hour today. The, the the lunch is here. I thought yesterday we had to go out, so it's uh, what do I got? It's about twelve twenty-six. Uh, let's uh, start about. Uh,